Hi, I'm Tom Jankowski, Garfield County Commissioner. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, virtual Grizzly Creek Fire Community Meeting. Um, last time I was in front of all of you, I think I did a lot of thank yous, and I want to I want to do some, just want to talk about some things I'm thankful for. I know our community's been, we've been really on edge. We've had the fire at the edge of our community, and uh, it, it's been quite a, it's, it's been a catastrophe to say the least. But I want to say I'm really thankful to this uh, incident fire command team that they, uh, we had fire all around the community of no name. We didn't lose any structures. The fire was up against the east side of Glenwood Springs and didn't come into Glenwood Springs. They uh, saved Bear Ranch. And, um, and then we have our, our subdivisions are on the south side of the fire, on the south side of the thing. And all those, we didn't lose any structures in those subdivisions. When we had a small lightning fire, which was called the uh, Red Canyon Fire on Wednesday, the, this incident command team came in with Carbondale Fire and put that out immediately. And so we've got, we have a lot to be thankful for. I think as uh, uh, Scott Fitzwilliams said, the uh, U.S. Forest Service uh, superintendent for White River National Forest said that, uh, you know, we were, um, we didn't lose Hanging Lake and that was an act of God. So uh, I really want to uh, thank the firefighters. I hit, was in a meeting earlier with Senator Bennett and he talked about, um, he, was, he was getting updated on the fire. And um, one thing I said to him, I said, when you go back to Washington, tell them how impressed and, and how important it is that we have these fire teams that come into our community, they put their lives at risk, and they, um, and they don't have roots in our community, but they really are our heroes and they help save us. And, and this incident command team's getting ready to be ship out to another fire, but I, I really want them to hear that we're very appreciative of what they've done. So with that, Jim, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, good evening. My name is Jennifer Miss Livy. I'm the fire, fire information officer for the Grizzly Creek Fire, and welcome to tonight's live community meeting. We're going to share with you some great and valuable information that you'll be able to ask questions um, at the end of the session. Please keep those as fire-related questions. I know there's going to be a lot of them. We want to make sure we can answer all of those. First up, we have Mark Koppel. He is the Air Resource Advisor, and he's going to talk about smoke. Mark? Good evening. Um, as she said, Mark Koppel, Air Resource Advisor for the Grizzly Creek Fire. I'm um, here to talk to you about smoke um, conditions today, um, forecasts. Um, pretty much today was moderate to um, um, USG, which means uh, unhealthy for sensitive groups. Um, we had that pretty much throughout the whole area from um, Glenwood Springs all the way to Vail and then down to Aspen. Um, we forecast various areas and um, our areas um, uh, within about a 100, 100 mile radius. So anyway, with, with the, the smoke conditions today with the unhealthy for sensitive groups, um, I want folks to be aware that um, in that particular population for uh, what we call USG, um, it, it's anybody who's immune compromised um, and that means anybody with a um, respiratory issue, anything like that, um, uh, elderly people, people that are recovering from COVID or have COVID, and also um, children from um, infant to 18. Their lungs are still developing. So when you see on our forecast where you see USG, we really encourage you to seek shelter, clean air, um, try not to, to go outside. Our outlooks that we produce, think of as a tool, a planning tool of um, what you, um, to plan your day on for outside. So uh, tomorrow we kind of expect the same conditions, moderate to unhealthy for um, sensitive groups. Um, be aware, to, um, look at our um, uh, smoke outlooks, um, plan ahead with them. They are available on wildlandfiresmoke.net forward slash outlooks. Um, you can take a look at those. Um, they're throughout all of Cal 
Colorado right now. And um, you get a good idea of what the conditions are going to be for um, tomorrow and the next day. So um, with that, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Mark, thank you for that information. Those smoke outlooks also can be found on the Grizzly Creek Fire Facebook page and the NC web under Grizzly Creek Fire. Um, next, we have Jeff Serber, Gray Basin Team Operations Section Chief. He's going to give you a Google Earth flyover and an operational update. Go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, Jennifer. Good evening. Uh, I think we'll start off with a map of the fire tonight and kind of go around uh, showing uh, I'd encourage anybody that wants to see this map probably better. It's uh, available to you on the on probably the, uh, several places on the internet. But if you're interested in specific geographic areas and whether the fire reached it, that would be the map to to find. Um, so starting in the I-70 corridor, right right over there, uh, right here um, at No Name. Excuse me, right here at No Name along. Uh, I-70, you can see where the fire never made it down to I-70, but it did wrap itself into I-70 over here. So we spent several days nursing that fire down to the bottom of the canyon and holding it along the creek at the bottom. That's now called contained, considered contained line, up to uh, probably a mile or two, maybe a mile and a half south of Windy, Windy Point. And uh, beyond that, all this country that I'm pointing out here is uh, over to Grizzly is uh, remains uncontained, as well as uh, quite a bit of the rest of the fire over there towards Coffee Pot. Coming around, we've added a containment line on the east side, on the south side, on the east side of the of the fire, south side of I-70, and then uh, wrapping around over. I'll just highlight the the areas that we consider contained now, where it uh, where it popped up on top, and it lost its uh, its uh, speed and. Uh, availability of, of dry vegetation that got into more moist vegetation and flatter ground. So I just kind of wanted to use the map pretty much to show the increase in containment that's been achieved in the last couple of days. I think we were at 11 percent and now we're at 22 percent, so that's good news. And I would expect that over the, over the coming days we'll continue to add to that containment. So to get a little bit more specific, um, you know, you can you can see a little bit better terrain-wise what I was talking about, uh, the fire being held in the bottom of No Name. Windy Point is right out here. The fire continues to back down into No Name and into Grizzly from both directions. Um, the uh, speed at which it's moving is has been substantially reduced for the last two or three days. It's uh, been calm. It continues to smolder mostly. I saw a little bit of group tree torching yesterday, but very little movement in the, in the perimeter of the fire. Uh, what we've done up in here, where the fire slops over into Grizzly, it'll continue to, to drop down into Grizzly more than likely. Need that? Okay. It'll continue to drop down into Grizzly more than likely um, because we can't not follow it down in there and put out that edge. So what we've done here is uh, where it comes up out of Grizzly, we have a dozer line around all this fire crossing over right here by this little gap to make sure this uh, this portion of the fire that didn't burn. There's a reason this didn't burn. Typically on windy days, if you end up with an island like this, a green island that's this big, it's because it's aspen or some other vegetation that uh, got out of the wind and uh, wasn't that burnable. So that's uh, likely to stay there and not fill in. Some portions of it may fill in, but probably not the whole thing. Again, I'll, I'll reiterate that um, when we make these maps, they all look like Everything's burned and it's not. We cannot show every little island of green. There could be 100 acres out there in the middle of the fire or more that's green. Uh, so don't believe that everything that's shown within that perimeter is black sticks. It's some of it is totally unburned. Some of it is partially burned where you'd look at it and you would you look at the canopy and not even realize that it burned because it, it was ground fire that burned everything on the ground, but it didn't get into the trees. So there's a variety of intensity of fire within the perimeter. Uh, moving across, we have pretty much, we're starting to get this pretty well secured all the way from Grizzly over to Coffee Pot. I would expect that that part of the fire will be uh, turning, that perimeter of the fire will be uh, contained in the next few days. Um, so that's good news also. From Coffee Pot down to, here's the Coffee Pot Road right here. As you can see, it crossed the Coffee Pot Road in only one spot, and that was th three days ago, probably maybe four now. 
when it made a run up the hill and was able to get across the switchback. And then uh, we had folks up here that were fighting the fire and aircraft and were able to stop it on the road. It also lost a lot of intensity, as you can see. It got out of the pinion juniper oak brush type and hit the aspen and sagebrush and, and the greener country up there that didn't really want to burn near as intensely. So we had people on the road that were able to spray water and pretty much hold that. We're uh, looking good all the way down into the I-70 corridor. Yesterday when I flew, I saw one smoke up here on top of a cliff that we have not put people in. Um, we have shown that as being black, even though there's probably still a couple smokes on the line. Uh, that vegetation is very sparse, as you can see if I zoom in. Lots of cliff, lots of bare, bare dirt. So even if something rolls down, there's very little opportunity for it to pick back up because there's no ground fuel to, to start. So rather than putting people up in this extreme terrain, we observe it from the air, we watch it, um, but we don't feel like it has enough potential to continue to show that perimeter green. You can see over here at the Bear Ranch, um, this, this entire line here has been turned uh, black to show that it's contained. You can kind of see there's uh, 100 cabins right there. We burned out around those probably uh, close to five or six days ago. Everything's secure, cooling down real nice, coming across. Uh, I'll kind of zoom out and show what's been burned since this perimeter was done. Yesterday, we burned down this road. You can kind of see where there was still some unsecure fire edge right here. And in order to lock that fire up from being able to come down downhill with a downdraft out of a thunderstorm, what we've done is this over here was burned the day before off of a, off of a road that comes around the corner and comes back down into Ike Canyon. So we burned off this road and came all the way down and locked it back into the main fire so that this, this fire up in this area can't return and run down towards the road and get across that road and continue downhill. So this is all secure in here now. You'll, the, the newest uh, perimeter will show that that's been burned out and within a few days we'll likely turn that line black to show that it's uh, secure. Today we're burning, if any of you saw smoke in the air, it's because uh, this, this road right there that you can see in the middle of the screen was already an existing road. And we took some uh, heavy equipment down through here. As you can see, it had a little bit of an ability to come up out of this, uh, this spruce drainage and spot across and then get, get up and, and make a run to wherever it wanted to go beyond that. So we look at these places from the air, we look at them from the ground, and we see that Spruce Ridge itself is pretty bare all the way down. But this pocket right here, this run from this fire wanted to come this way. And you can see, I think I pointed out before, there's a big lava flow right there. That's all rock. So it was able, the fire was uh, stopped, uh, uh, a lot of its forward advance was stopped by the uh, lava flow. And then we put in a line here, burned off that line. That's what this red edge is that comes right along here is that was a burnout operation back over to where there's no vegetation on the, on the ridge top. And since uh, this is a, a Google Earth satellite view, it doesn't, you know, obviously won't show all the work that's been done in the last few days. So what we've done is we've taken dozer line off this, off this ridge right here brought it down, connected back over to the main fire here because we're trying to protect this lodge structure right there. You can see the roof, roof of it. So what we plan to do, what's that smoke that you saw today, is burning this back up along that dozer line until it comes all the way back up, burning across probably about where my, my mouse pointer is, through this drainage and then back over to this to lock all this fire off that's up here that would be able to possibly make a run in a, in, during a wind event. So as we burn along there, we have support from fire engines, uh, helicopters, whatever it is we need to, to catch spots that might occur from a downdraft or, or any, for any other reason, spot back across the line from an ember and then be able to take off down below. So that's what the firefighters are doing over on that division today. You can see up on our division Zulu, that, that area that's been turned black along the perimeter, they're starting to feel very secure. Again, this fire made a hard run in the wind with the fuel, hit that, and they've been able to pick up any of the spots like that little black spot right there. They've, they've driven to that, put a hose around it, or sprayed water from a truck and made sure that it's dead. So they've done that all along here, walked the edges, and we'll continue to see this line along the top south side turn black over the next few days as soon as they feel like it's uh, they're comfortable with the fact that it doesn't have enough heat left in it to uh, get up and run again. Moving over to our last division, Division Alpha right here. 
I think I've described a few times, uh, there's a power pole right up here that comes up out of the canyon and continues on to the south. Uh, we have been able to take a dozer all the way down from the top, from about where this hairpin is on the road. Uh, brought them in here and then took them down here all the way through this to down and out to this point. Uh, we did that by laying retardant in here. Uh, there's half burned oak brush. Uh, nobody wants to walk into half burned oak brush from above when you don't know what's happening down inside of it, how much heat is in it and how much it might be able to uh, pick up and force you to run uphill away from it. So we didn't do that. We, we threw a lot of retardant at it. We took heavy equipment in and slowly worked our way down the edge of the fire. With, a pe with pieces of heavy equipment and crews following it up to make sure that fire's out. That line should be complete today or maybe early tomorrow morning. That gives us the ability to say we've locked it off from coming back towards Glenwood Springs and having to use this uh, contingency line that I've described before that came all the way out from the main fire, followed a road system up to Lookout Mountain, over, over to Lookout uh, Park. This is actually labeled Lookout Mountain right there, but I believe that's called Lookout Park and Lookout Mountain is where the, where the uh, antennas are. And then we improved some hand line that came down around the city of Glenwood uh, behind the town and, and back to I-70 in the river, and we shouldn't have to use that. That's, that's the intent behind locking this portion of the fire up with a dozer and hand crews and, and uh, babysitting it for a while and making sure that uh, there's no heat left in there. Finally, uh, we continue to have an IA group out there, an uh, in initial attack group that Will, uh, that is available at both ends of the fire on the I-70 corridor that can respond to new at initial attacks like that one the other day over off the 115 road. The fire was called Red Mountain or Red uh, Canyon. And, uh, you know, we'll continue that the entire time we'll we're here uh, with uh, some of the engine and, and uh, other resources that we can respond quickly from our fire to go to any new, uh, new start. So that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for that very informative um, flyover and information for the Grizzly Creek Fire. Next, we have Marty Adele, um, Grizzly Creek Fire Incident Commander. Marty? Good evening. Uh, for, this, for this evening, I'd like to discuss with you all the, what's going to happen with the team and the management of this incident over the next four or five days. We, as an incident management team, are coming to the end of our tour. And with that, uh, we go through a very complex uh, matrices to figure out what type of management needs to be, continued, needs to be done on this incident. And when that was done by the, the folks on the, the Forest Service staff around here, we realized that it, it's needing another Type 1 incident management team to come in behind us. So right now, our team with Jeff, Jennifer, and everyone else, we will be here through Tuesday. Uh, we have ordered another Type 1 team. This Type 1 team is coming out of Alaska with the IC of Norm McDonald. They are incredibly experienced. Uh, they are very capable of running a fire just like this. They've been doing it, some of them, for uh, quite some time, for years now. So you are in very good hands. With that being said, in the timeline that... Uh, we have for the next couple of days is once again, I, as I stated, we have ordered the team. They are in transit right now. There will be an in briefing at 1700 on Monday. At this point, the, the managers of the land, whether it's the county perspective, the Forest Service, the BLM, they will give the team uh, their direction, leaders' intent, and the priorities that we've been working with for the past week and a half to two weeks to get to the end point of this fire. The next day is what we call a transition day. Our team, Great Basin Team 1, will basically marry up with the Alaskan team coming in. And we will show them what we're doing, how we're doing it, why we're doing it, and basically a coordinated effort to, so there's a seamless transition of power. They continue on with the good work that we, Jeff and Jennifer, and the rest of the team have been doing with our partners with the Forest Service, BLM, county, sheriffs, uh, as CDOT, to make sure that we get to the end point of this fire in a safe, manageable, and uh, efficient manner. So by the end of that day, that team, the Alaska team, will have all the information that we currently have, 
They will have the direction and the processes down. At that point, we will have a transfer of command where our team will very quietly step aside and the Alaska team will take control of the fire uh, under the guidance, once again, of the Forest Service BLM and county. We, at that time, the Great Basin Team 1, will have a closeout Saturday, or excuse me, Wednesday morning, uh, the 26th, and at that point, we will travel home for a couple days off and then rotate back into uh, a rotation where we could go to another fire somewhere else in the country. That's all I have for this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marty. Also to include, um, and during our next live public meeting, we will introduce the incident commander of the Alaska team, so you will see those individuals on the next public meeting. Um, next, we have Eagle County Under Sheriff Mike McWilliams, and he's going to talk about evacuations and other things pertaining to the counties. Good evening. A piece of good news tonight, uh, beginning tomorrow, Sunday, August 23rd, Cottonwood Pass will open for critical local passenger vehicle traffic. What that means is al allowable local traffic, such as travel to and from work or school, travel to medical, dental, or veterinary appointments, travel to other essential businesses or services in Eagle, Garfield, or Picking County. Only regular passenger vehicles and pickup trucks will be allowed on Cottonwood Pass without pre-approval. Travelers should be prepared to show their need to travel, such as a work ID or badge, confirmation of a doctor's appointment, or a letter from their employer. Please visit ecemergency.org. That's ecemergency.org for more information on that. And vehicles must be 35 feet or less to be able to go over Cottonwood Pass. There are currently no evacuations in Eagle County. That's good news. Uh, the Ruby Creek fire near Walcott was contained yesterday. More good news. Um, the Coffee Pot Road remains closed to the public, but the people who live there can come and go on that road. Independence Pass is open to passenger vehicles only with limited access and alternating traffic on the narrow section of the roadway known as the Narrows. Crooked Creek Pass, Forest Service Road 400, that goes from Eagle to Thomasville is still closed by the Forest Service. Colorado River Road is open, but all river access from Cottonwood to Dotsera Landing is closed, including BLM campgrounds on that lower part of the river because of fire fighting activity and we're trying to keep everyone safe. If you're going to travel to BLM or Forest Service land, check their websites because there are some closures because of the fire on both BLM and Forest Service. On Thursday, August 20th, the governor's executive order of a statewide fire ban went into effect. You need to please remember that Eagle County Stage 2 fire restrictions are more restrictive and supersede the statewide ban. You can find information on Eagle County Stage 2 fire restrictions at ecemergency.org. Please continue to respect this fire ban because it, it helps keep our firefighters and other public safety professionals safe. Please don't let your guard down with the increased fire activity we've seen this past week. It's important to sign up through ecalert.org. That's ecalert.org if you live in Eagle County to receive pre-evacuation or evacuation orders if you haven't already signed up. It is very important that you make sure that you add your address on the profile on ecalert.org because otherwise you may not receive alerts for the particular section of Eagle County where you live. Thank you. I think you and Sheriff appreciate that. Next we have Garfield County Commissioner Tom Jankowski. He's going to talk about Garfield County restrictions and evacuations. 
Tom get close to the mic. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, things really haven't changed as far as uh, evacu evacuation activity. Currently, No Name, Lookout Mountain, Homestead Estates, Bear Ranch, High Aspen Ranch, Coulter Creek, Cottonwood Pass, Spring Valley Ranch, and roads leading to Coffee Pot are, are closed and, and are to be evacuated. I would like to take a second to thank the Hotel Denver and Hotel Glenwood Springs who have put up uh, evacuees from the no-name area. Uh, communities in pre-evacuation are uh, Buck Point Drive, Derby Mesa Loop, Dotsero, Sweetwater, and residents south and west of County Road 115. I would like to take, it was good news to hear from Eagle County Sheriff and would like to thank Eagle County for getting Cottonwood Pass par partially opened they have uh, put flaggers on both sides of that pass, and we appreciate that. Uh, again, this is uh, from Garfield County. We want to thank all the firefighters and all the first responders and all the sheriff and, and everybody that's worked on this. It's, uh, you, we can't, can't thank you enough. Thank you, Commissioner. Next, we have Mike Goolsby, the CDOT Northwest Colorado Regional Director. He's going to talk about I-70. Mike? Thank you, Jennifer. Good evening. Uh, when uh, all this took place, uh, starting about uh, last Tuesday, uh, we met with uh, both counties, Eagle and Garfield, the Great Basin team, and some other lo local and state agencies to start the discussion around opening I-70. Uh, we developed some criteria around what it would take to open the road. Um, some of that was supporting the firefighting duties, uh, having quick response from the firefighting teams, and also having the, av the availability of being able to do air ops in the canyon. Um, with that, uh, we had to bring in our federal partners and our state bridge inspectors to look at all the infrastructure out there. Um, in addition, uh, current rock fall that's going on. Um, there were quite a few different variables that we came up with to make a determination on whether or not and how fast we were going to open the road. Um, currently, uh, I can tell you that it's going to be days, not weeks. Um, we've, we've hit a lot of those criteria to this point, and right now um, we feel pretty positive about where we're at. I would caution all of you that um, working with the Forest Service and the Bear Team, and if we get the appropriate amount of moisture that will cause uh, debris flows and other things, um, we could go back to a closed status fairly quickly. In addition to that, any fire behavior that may cause us to shut the road back down, we will do so. Um, when we do open the road back up, the one thing that we will do is we will still run the head-to-head -head traffic that we currently have in the canyon for the construction project. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One. Uh, Excel Energy is in there currently repairing power lines that supply things to the west. The other part of that is, is the majority of the rockfall activity that we are seeing is impacting the westbound portion of the interstate. Not a lot of things are happening to the eastbound currently. Um, also, with that being said, it gives us an opportunity to be able to move fire crews quickly through the canyon, um, not impacting traffic. Um, again, uh, can't give you a specific day when we're going to open I-70. That will be a variable that we're still working on, but I can honestly tell you it'll be days, not weeks. So with that, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Mike, appreciate that update. And finally, we have Scott Fitzwilliams, um, White River um, National Forest Forest Supervisor. Scott. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks, Mike. I, I want to start by just thanking CDOT a whole bunch. Um, the work they're doing to get that interstate back up and running has been amazing, and um, it's uh, we all have to work together, and they've been really patient about our operations, the needs of the team, the needs of the aircraft, and, and we all know what a huge burden it is not to have um, that interstate open. So thanks, Mike and CDOT. And I know, Mike, you gave up some uh, personal time to be here tonight. We greatly appreciate it. So um, so we're enjoying some success. We're hearing a lot of good things coming from Jeff and, and Marty and, and, and their team. Um, 
we're hearing, you know, good things about road openings and, and you know, things around the corner. So um, I know we're all thrilled about that. I know we're all really excited to uh, know that there's more black line around that fire every day. And we love to see that, and I sure do too. So, um, but we're kind of moving into the, the fa another phase of the fire. In addition to, as Marty talked about, the transition to a new team, which um, we do all the time, and it's pretty seamless, um, and I expect this next one to be, but also transitioning a little bit about the work we're doing, and, and, and it's less um, of the craziness that we've all had to deal with in the early stages of it, more of a grind. It's, it's making sure we're, we're moving step by step, tying up in, um, each area of the fire. And, and so I look forward to that part. We're gonna keep our focus on keeping people safe, keeping firefighters safe, That'll always be um, our primary objective, um, but um, we're making progress, and I think that's fantastic, um, and I know everyone else does. Um, closures are still in effect, you know, large closure on the White River National Forest, and again, as been mentioned a couple of meetings, we, you know, archery season, hunting season's around the corner. Usually people are starting to get out and do some scouting. Just uh, if, if you or, or anyone you know is, is planning on, on getting out there, check those maps of, of the closure orders. Our sense is that it's going to be a while before these areas are safe to, to allow people in. So uh, plan accordingly. Fortunately, there's huge areas of both BLM land and, and national forests that are still open. I want to touch a little bit, and Mike um, from CDOT talked a little bit, on, and I have this map, and somewhere there's a pointer. Is that it? Of course, now I have to learn how to use it. Uh, um, I want to show a couple maps to you tonight because as we move forward and as we discuss a, a lot of information about the canyon and, and the issues surrounding opening the highway, we're going we're gonna to talk about this. Um, it, was, it was mentioned at last meeting that we, we brought in a, a bear team to do an initial assessment. Normally, these, these teams are brought in when we're 70, 80 percent contained, but because of the steep terrain, because of the interstate, we wanted to bring that team in as, as, soon, as, we can, as soon as we could. And they've done some initial work. I'm just going to throw this map. This map you're looking at is, is just a soil burn severity map. And this is one of the first things that they're able to produce. And what it shows is, is how burned and how severely um, soil was was charred in this fire. And uh, you can see the canyon, it wasn't too bad. That's because it's primarily rock, and, and so it doesn't really show up. They're using this information to uh, eventually get to, and if you go to the next slide, um, the next map, let me pull up the next map. And this is a, nope, this one. These are maps, I think, as we do more of these meetings and as we uh, discuss more of this with the community and certainly working with CDOT, we're going to talk more about them. And we'll get people um, to discuss these maps that are far better experts than I am. I'm, I'm not at all. But what these maps are showing us and what these initial assessments are showing us is where we think the highest severity or the highest potential for severe um, debris flows are. And you can see those are the areas in red, and there are a lot of them. That's uh, the area around No Name and Grizzly Creek, just for um, an example. So these are the areas we're going to be concerned about for two reasons. One is obvious that any debris slides, um, debris flows onto the highway. And number two, um, trying to uh, assess the, the Grizzly Creek and No Name drainages as far as how it's affecting Glenwood Springs water. So uh, as we move forward and, uh, and when the bear team comes back after um, the fire is a little more contained, they will dive deep into this. There's, um, what this does is gives us some idea where to watch, where to monitor, where to notify CDOT that, hey, these are some areas that if we get you know, a significant amount of rainfall of an inch an hour or so, um, these are the areas that have the, the highest potential to, to, to slide or to, to have debris flows. And um, the, the difficult part of this canyon and these canyons is there's, there's not a ton of engineering we can do. Talking to CDOT and we'll work with them on some of the things we can do with rock um, um, engineering to catch rocks and things like that. But, a lot of these areas are just too steep, and there's not, there's not ways to really just engineer um, debris flows out of the, the equation. 
you know, um, the team has looked back at, at similar geology, similar soil types across uh, this area, including, um, you know, um, the coal seam and even as back far as the um, Storm King mountain fire. And, and we're able to draw some conclusions or some assumptions anyway on what could happen, similar area, similar geology, similar soil, um, what type of debris flow we can expect. But as Mike said earlier, across the, um, you know, for, for the foreseeable future, we're going to be dealing with this and we're going to be looking at these kind of maps a lot. And, and we could probably expect, you know, inconveniences in that canyon for quite a while, especially after snow and as we get into spring. So I, I just wanted to introduce those maps tonight. Um, we'll, we'll, again, we're going to have people that are far more um, um, skilled and have high level of expertise that can explain this more and more to the public. Other than that, um, I don't have much more tonight. Um, again, thank you, the team. It, it, it's just been uh, a real pleasure to work with the communities and the team. We've made great progress. I, I really expected um, things to get a little, quite a bit worse, and, and they're getting better faster than I thought. So thank you, and look forward to taking any questions. Thank you, Scott, for that detailed information. And thank you to all our presenters for sharing the information that you guys have set forth. Um, throughout this briefing or after this live community meeting, we've been um, collecting all of your questions. Tracy Weaver is now going to moderate those questions and try to answer as many as we can. Tracy? So the first couple questions are for Operations Section Chief Jeff Serber. Or I should call him uh, Sam, Elliott. Sam Elliott, since that's the way the question was addressed. Um, <laughs> Has this been one of the more challenging fires for you due to the steep canyon walls, as well as all the assets along I-70, including electricity, water, and structures? I'd say yes, um, it has been. There's a lot of uh, moving parts, we call them, on fires where a lot of cooperation amongst agencies. Uh, there's the railroad, the power companies, the transportation officials, um, the homeowners, the, you know, there's just a lot involved in this fire, the, the National Forest and, and you know, um, typically on type one fires, th th those are fires where we have a lot of uh, complexities regarding um, whether it be multiple counties, multiple jurisdictions, all those kinds of things. So we are, we are familiar with it, but this has been a challenging fire. It would have been way more challenging if it had stayed a red flag and we were still chasing it. Uh, we had some help from Mother Nature, uh, which I've talked about. We also had, well, both both in the way of weather as well as the vegetation type change. So um, it has been challenging, though, and, and it has been one of the more challenging that I can remember. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, the team that I belong or that I belong to, you know, Marty's team is uh, is very professional and and uh, experienced and. You know, I hope that's the way we come across because uh, that that's true for everybody. I, I'm always amazed at the comments we get from people, the appreciation that we, we get from people, but and, and the fact that they they talk about how fast we we come in and we set up a camp and we do all those things. But we're here for you, and we're here because we enjoy doing that, coming in, helping people, and uh, we each have our little bit of expertise. Mine happens to be the, on the operations section, but those folks behind the scenes, uh, like logistics and plans, and all the all the people that put together these maps. I mean, they're the they're we couldn't do any of it without everyone else, and I'd like to give them credit too. But uh, it's challenged. It's been a challenge for all of us. So I've got a few more questions for you, Jeff. Um, one is, how does an area get classified as contained? I know you talked about that the other night, and just wondering if you're curious <laughs> about uh, what containment might be tomorrow. So the way we we look at containment, there's not a clear cut like uh, definition. There there is a, a definition in my mind, and there's a, there's I'm sure a definition of what containment means, a dictionary definition. But what we typically do is rely upon the folks in the field. I I do spend time. I've been pretty much almost around probably three quarters to more of the fire in a vehicle, talking to people, looking at the fire edge. I fly it almost every day. We, we, you know, for those people that are right up against the fire line, those are the people that 
transfer information back as far as their comfort level with the fact that even if a wind event or something occurred, they still feel pretty comfortable that it won't escape. It does not mean that it's controlled by any stretch because you can have heat 100 feet from the line that nobody could see that picks up in the wind and if the wind is strong enough and blows it back across the line when nobody is there to see it and it can pick up and take off again. So we usually wait us wait maybe 24, 48 hours after we're, you know, we, we build our confidence as we go and we try to be fairly conservative about containment because there's nothing uh, that we, we don't want to give a false sense of security to people and then lose something because uh, we've done that. I'd rather err on the side of caution and uh, it's an embarrassment, to tell you the truth, if, uh, if we call something contained and then it escapes, it's not anything anybody's proud of. It's, uh, it's something that we strive not to let happen. So that is uh, probably a, not a clear-cut definition of what containment is, but I rely heavily on the people on the ground to tell me when they feel comfortable that, that it's out enough that, they've, that they want to turn it black. And those are the people that turn that line black. We ask them every day, you know, how much of that perimeter that you've been working on for the last week can be turned turned black now what do you feel comfortable with and if they don't feel comf a comfort level with it we usually won't do it I may go out and look at the line and you know determine whether I feel more comfortable with it but that's that's pretty much what we do the way we look at that and tomorrow I hate to speculate I I, I, I think uh, I know there will be more um, I know s some specific spots every one of those black spots that's up there will gain a little bit except for the the piece that's there in uh, in no name no name uh, right here I don't expect that line that black line to go farther north until we uh, do something with it we don't have people down there on that piece of line so there's no way we're gonna call that contained until somebody actually can get down on the ground and look at it or we leave it red until it rains enough that we don't find any more smoke we fly infrared flights the infra if the infrared shows that there's no heat source left there when they fly by and they and we get map a couple days of maps when the, it's showing that there's absolutely no heat left because we've received a, a lot of rain let's say then that starts to become that comfort level increases and we and we look at turning those black but until then i wouldn't expect this line to grow this way over the next couple of days i'd expect this all of this to start to close in probably from both directions this the same way. This has been about a day or so since it was burned. It, once it cools down, I'd expect this line to advance, but we're burning right here right now. So that, that's gonna stay red for a while. And then up here, this will this from Grizzly across, from Grizzly right there, back across to Coffee Pot. It'll grow in the next couple of, couple to three shifts, I would say that'll turn black. And I, 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 I don't know what percentage of the entire perimeter that would be, but. I kind of described what I expect to happen. So we did just get a, a mole that sent us a text and said it's 30% for tomorrow. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder who that was. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in plans, maybe. Um, is there any thought to taking a crew up the transfer trail to Bowen's Loop to keep the fire from progressing farther north in that direction? Yes, we've been looking at that. We have a multiple crews we have what's called a wildland fire use module out there they do they spend a lot of time uh, analyzing sitting on rim rock looking at the fire trying to figure out ways to get down there um, in fact on division alpha that little piece i was just talking about several days ago they didn't feel that this was doable and that's why they went to all the effort to build that contingency line they felt that that was too dangerous to send firefighters in so we sent a couple more crews over there and I flew it and we all put our heads together and said, you know, what would it take to get to that, that comfort level to, to block that off instead of resorting to the eight miles of line. And, and we slowly came to the agreement that it would take retardant, uh, heavy retardant. It had been the VLAT, the very large air tanker had dropped there a couple times early on and they have to drop high enough that when the retardant comes down, it's in a mist. So the mist, suppresses the fire but it doesn't always penetrate the vegetation especially oak brush so we had a port portable retardant plant on the highway we picked up buckets with helicopters took it up there where you can more surgically throw retardant on those hot spots and on that line until it's so tamped down and wet that pe that people start to feel com a comfort level with walking into a spot like that because it's not going to get up and and run at them or they, they 
you know, there's enough uh, vegetation that's covered with retardant that it's that they just kind of go, okay, now I'm willing to go down there because I know that fire is not going to pick up and catch me. So we did that right there. And initially they were saying, we don't want to do that. But then over a period of a day or two, it was like, yeah, we could do that. You know, so based upon that question you just asked, we've looked at Broken Rib Trail, which is out in front of the, in front of it right now. We have the big box trail that I think probably shows up on some of our maps that was a uh, road systems way out at the headwaters of both No Name and, uh, and Grizzly. But we want to back off if we can and find out, find better ways. And sometimes that just takes people on the ground staring at it for a day or two, kind of going, well, I think we could do this and I think we could do that. And they kind of put together a plan, but it takes, it takes that ability to be right there and look at it long enough to figure out how to, how to make, how to fit the puzzle pieces together and connect lines, connect the dots kind of. So, so yes, we we're looking at, at other opportunities, whether it be Bowen Loop or, um, Broken Rib Trail or any of those other opportunities we might have to drop down into those canyons and stop it. Thank you. And then a couple questions on some of the um, evacuated subdivisions like Homestead and High Aspen. What kind of activities have been going on around there as far as the fire? Well, that whole south end, the same activity really has been going on. That's been line building, what we call hot spotting, where we use... Uh, whether it be water from helicopters, water from trucks, we cut line, we walk along the edge of the line and use dirt to suppress the fire on that edge. So to prevent it southerly movement towards those subdivisions, uh, we're using all those means. We're not as much on the, in the air as you've probably noticed, there aren't near as many aircraft flying and that's because they're not necessary. Most of this work along uh, on the ground, we can reach with either on that south southerly uh, piece anyway, can be reached with uh, some equipment because we built dozer line and the equipment can drive along the dozer line. We can we have UTVs that we're transporting personnel in, so they don't have to walk five miles to get to the spot where they need to work. They can they can drive to those spots and then get out in there. They can produce they can uh, have better production of of uh, hand line and and other uh, other activities in those areas. So. We're, we continue to kind of penetrate into those areas that are still shown as red to stop that southerly advancement using whatever means we deem necessary. And we've had what we need, especially in the way of aircraft, but uh, even our other firefighting resources have been adequate to slow that down. And I, I think, like I say, that uh, containment will be increased across that south end in the coming days. Are you familiar with the two rivers? subdivision is it still in danger somebody could point it out for me i'm not familiar with two rivers i'm trying to find that out <laughs> two rivers does anybody know where that is to tell you the truth um what i typically look at from the air i, I look at topographic maps like this so I, I learned geographic features off this style of a map uh drainage but drainage names bear ranch you know uh, geographic and and local features are much easier for me to identify than a subdivision on the ground. I see them, I see the subdivisions, I see the houses when I'm flying. I don't associate those with a subdivision name because we don't use maps that have those names on them. So we are monitoring everything out there on the south end. I, there's, there really isn't anything on the north end as, other than cabins and, and scattered uh, improvements. So I'm guessing that that subdivision might be on the south or southeast eastern part of the fire. And if it is, um, that my answer would remain the same as it was before that we're using all those means to try to get that line contained. And like I say, I'm, I, I apologize for not knowing the, the common names for the subdivisions here or a lot of other fires we go to, but our maps really don't display that. But be ass rest assured that I spend enough time in the air that I see the road cuts and the scattered houses on 40 acre parcels and all that's really visible. So. The, the name to me, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but the name of those houses down there doesn't matter. It's just the fact that those houses are there that I have to concentrate on to keep the fire from getting to to those areas. So I just found out it's in it's a subdivision in Dotsero. Oh, it's in Dotsero. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. That I, I think you can tell by that map that we we're feeling really confident with that south that east side of the fire over towards Dotsero. Like I say, I saw. I think I said in this meeting, we had another meeting recently, but I think this one was where I mentioned the um, the smoke that w that I found up on the rim rock on the north side of 70 yesterday where nobody has walked yet. 
but its uh, ability to escape is very limited because of the of the bare dirt and and no real uh, vegetation that could catch from that log. So rather than walking people out to the edge of cliffs and dealing with one pinion pine that's sitting out there that's smoldering, it may be visible to folks on I-70 or whatever, but it's not, if it has any chance of being a problem, we'll go dump water on it and we'll be, have somebody across the canyon towards the Bear Ranch looking back at it, monitoring that thing to make sure it doesn't have the ability to escape. Thank you, Jeff, and lots of thank yous in the comments today for your explanation of things. We appreciate Thanks. it. Next, I have a couple questions for Instant Commander Marty Adel. Yes. Stand up close to the mic. Copy. Um, what is triggering the transition to the Alaska Instant Management team on a Monday, Tuesday? What, why is that happening then? Well, uh, it, what triggers it is our tour and how long it is. We generally go a 14-day tour. We started on a Monday, or excuse me, on a Wednesday, uh, which you count off 14 days. Our last day would be on a Tuesday. Thus, we want to get a team to come in, this time Alaska team, to come in, and we can give them a transition. Once again, uh, express what the important priorities are and give them all the information so they can have a seamless transition and then move forward. Great. Thank you. And then one more. Yeah. When will the evacuations be lifted in No Name? Uh, no Name. Uh, no Name, is, that area is pretty much directly connected to the opening of I-70. So as Mike stated earlier, we're looking at days and not weeks. Um, so it, it'll be a couple more days for sure. Uh, what, what I'd like to extend, not only the no name, but all the other communities that were evacuated or that we had, um, we requested to be evacuated under the circumstances that we had here a couple days, a couple weeks ago. Um, we appreciate everything that the burden that you're, that you're going through, uh, the hardship, we understand. Uh, many of the team have been in different scenarios very similar to that. So we understand what you're going through and we appreciate the fact that you're willing to step away from your homes for a time to allow us to do our job. It, it, it helps us. It takes one more, um, one more weight off our shoulders when we don't have to worry about individuals in those areas or we have to concentrate on different topics. We are allowed really to concentrate at the topic at hand of suppressing fire or to priorities that are uh, requested of us to take care of. So once again, we thank you for the burden you are uh, subject to. Thank you, Marty. You bet. Next couple questions are for Under Sheriff McWilliam. Will Cottonwood Pass be open 24 hours a day or will it only be certain travel hours? It'll start tomorrow morning and be open 24 hours a day. Great. And then have and there the, are road guards on both ends of it that will stop traffic if a truck tries to go through or something like that. Great. Um, have the pre-evacuation orders also been lifted on the east side? No. You still have pre-evacuations. Okay. Yes. We're getting more and more confident, as you can see, with all the black on there that it's not going to escape and get dot zero. But we still want people to be prepared and and. Keep in mind that something radical could happen with the weather that could endanger them. So we want them to be ready in that pre-evacuation mindset without being too nervous about it. Great. That's it for you. And I've got a, one question for Mike from uh, CDOT. At least I'm hoping this is a good question for you. Can I answer? I don't know. <laughs> you can. <laughs> is Amtrak still operating through the canyon? So I believe, and you guys help me if I'm wrong, but I believe the train started running uh, two days ago pretty regularly. And on my way up from Grand Junction this evening, we actually did see the Amtrak train headed to Grand Junction. So um, I believe it is. Perfect. That was it for you. Awesome. <laughs> And then I have one question for Scott Fitzwilliams. There you are. I was looking on the wrong side of the room for you. So this one has pertains to the upcoming coming hunting season. And um, 
are you is the White River National Forest working with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife to consider modifications to the hunting season, mainly due to the stress already on the wildlife? Of course, um, yes and no. Um, yes, we're working really closely with um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. In fact, next week, the heads of our agency and their agency and, and BLM are getting together and to, to look at this statewide because it's not just this fire. Obviously, there's large fires all across the state and, and get a coordinated, consistent um, messaging about it. As far as refunds and changes to to hunting seasons and, and things like that, that's completely a state um, CPW decision. Thank you. I believe that concludes our questions for tonight. Thank you to all our speakers. Thank you everyone for speaking tonight and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, that concludes our virtual public meeting for the Grizzly Creek Fire. Um, our next public meeting, our community meeting, is set for Tuesday, August 25th. Um, we actually extended it one day so that the new incident management team can arrive, be briefed, and then we'll introduce you to them on Tuesday. So again, the next community meeting will be um, Tuesday, August 26th, 25th, sorry, August 25th um, at 6 p.m. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.